queen of pop. She brought her liveness. She brought her identity. She brought energy. She brought her style. Mistress of reinvention. She just loves to shop. She lives to shop. With over 300 million record sales, Madonna's been at the top of her game for over four decades. But how did she get there? And what were the secrets behind the songs that made her a superstar? From the innocent. Holiday is a fun, frothy pop song. It's light as air, and you just can't resist how wonderful it is. To the provocative. Like a virgin, like, like a what? Excuse me, lady? to the track that defined an entire era. If there was ever a song that captured an attitude of the time, that was a moment. We speak to those who helped propel her to success. From the musicians... We decided that maybe this something between this song and this artist might be something magical. Living in a material world. And those who sang on her big hits... We finished Material Girl, and it was just like, oh, God, this is ridiculous. People are going to love this. To the writers. We did get the response that no one would ever sing a song titled Like a Virgin. But fortunately, it was perfect for one singer, and her name was Madonna. We reveal the ruthless ambition that took a struggling clubland hopeful. What are your dreams? What's left? Mm, to rule the world. To the pinnacle of global stardom. This is Madonna and the story of the three songs that defined her career. Madonna Louise Ciccone, a dance school dropout from Michigan who went on to conquer the world and enjoy a 40-year career of unparalleled success. It's just bigger than anything I could ever imagine. From New York street chic to blonde ambition, from leather-clad Dita to ray of light earth mother to Evita, over and over again, Madonna reinvented her music and look to become the ultimate pop star survivor. Was it 16 consecutive top five hits? Oh, I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> Madonna has one of the most groundbreaking careers in pop music, the first female pop star to have complete control over her career. From William Orbit to Demolition Crew, she's collaborated with the world's best producers to create the world's biggest hits. She is a vocalist who can bring her identity to everything she sings. And she's still going strong today. She was so heat-seeking, missile-focused on success. I want longevity as a human being. I want it to last forever. She was like that from the beginning, and she's still like that now. But if you want to understand why Madonna took the world by storm, you need to explore just three huge songs, her first three mega-hits. <laughs> to find the answer. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one. We have liftoff. It's 1982, and the Columbia Space Shuttle's taking off on its third mission into space. Jimmy Connors is bringing bad boy of tennis John McEnroe back down to Earth. And the sky's the limit for Michael Jackson as his Thriller album breaks all sales records. Meanwhile, a young Madonna Ciccone has risen from dance student in Michigan to be on the verge of releasing her first single. But it had been four tough years getting there. When Madonna was 20, she did what she now says is the bravest thing she'd ever done. She dropped out of dance college and she went to New York. She said it was the first time she'd been on a plane, first time she'd been in a taxi. She only had $35 in her pocket, but she had a dream and she had a belief, and it was for her the beginning of everything. Madonna worked at a Dunkin' Donuts to make money. She lived in really cruddy, broken down buildings and rough parts of town. To be a young woman on your own in Manhattan at the time, we had to be made out of pretty stern stuff. A lot of it has to do with imagination and the great desire and need to get out of that small town kind of feeling and go somewhere and be somebody because you feel like you're missing something. 
As well as being edgy, the city was a hotbed of artistic invention. In and around the club scene, the ambitious Madonna soaked up all the influences on offer. So the underground scene in New York in the early 80s when Madonna was running around was wild. It was filled with a lot of people who didn't have a lot of money but who had a lot of creativity. I would say there was just an incredible rhythmic surge in New York City during that time. The city was raw. The city was accessible. You could come from anywhere and absolutely reinvent yourself, and that's what Madonna did. There was a buzz going on with Madonna because Madonna had so much charisma. She was really a, a new upcoming uh, phenomenon, you know, in New, in New York. Everybody knew about her in, in, in town. Although New York had been at the center of earlier music trends, styles were heading in new directions. By that time, the big crest of disco had really come and then receded. People still wanted to dance, but it had to change a little bit. And Madonna's music really, early music really reflects that. She'd do her act at clubs, probably with pre-recorded music, doing like dance stuff at clubs. It was about the music, the presentation, the visual image. You, you, you can see that she's very influenced by people like Debbie Harry, who had that kind of glamour and grit. I was inspired by Debbie Harry because she seemed very in charge of what she was doing and she, she also had a sort of wittiness about her and street smarts and I, I liked her. She was a role model. Grace Jones is also the hypothesis of it. You don't just get music on its own. What you get is the music matches the attitude, which matches the visuals, which matches the videos. After months on the music circuit fringe, Madonna signed her first record deal. And in October 1982, her label released her debut single, Everybody. We had heard her sing Everybody, the song, Everybody, you know, which is sort of like a sing-along song. We was very impressed with it, and I, I liked it a lot when I first heard it. Everybody is like an anthem, but it's a very low-key anthem. It's a post-disco sound, so it's kind of like you can imagine being in an after-hours club as opposed to frenetically dancing on the dance floor. The song may have been low-key, but the singer had high-powered friends. And in her determination to be a success, she was prepared to call on them. Madonna had been dating the DJ at Danceteria, Mark Kamen's, and she decided that she was going to impress upon Mark that he needed to play this music. Now, this is his beautiful girlfriend, and it's a song that he liked, but he was afraid because he thought, what if everybody stops dancing? But he took the risk, he played it, and nobody stopped dancing. Everybody continued dancing, they loved it. Loved it and bought it. Not only did the song become a Clubland favorite, it reached the top five in the US dance charts. It's the world superstar in embryo. You can't yet tell she's gonna be a superstar, but what you can tell is she has an identity, she has an attitude, and she has a presence, and it's all there. Keen to cash in on her early success, Madonna's label rushed out a follow-up dance single, Burning Up. I'd really enjoyed Madonna's first singles, Burning Up and Everybody. They were so melodic, poppy, and dancey all at the same time. And then I saw a photograph of her. I thought, okay, she's sort of a contender here because she was combining the street look with this very accessible pop sound. It wasn't a hit, but that almost doesn't matter because every journey starts with a step and burning up is a very small but significant step. A much bigger step came six months later. Madonna released a feel-good pop anthem that would take her out of the dance charts and into the mainstream. Holiday is a fun, frothy pop song. The meaning isn't super deep. It's just a song about partying and having a little bit of fun. 
The upbeat lyrics were no accident. They were written as an antidote to the depressing events that dominated the early 80s news cycle. I was inspired uh, by watching the television news at the time. It was troubling to see so much turmoil and this confusion, so it came to me like if we just had one day that we can just stop everywhere over the world, that would be like a really great thing. So the lyrics came if we took a holiday, took some time to celebrate just one day out of life, it would be so nice. Sometimes when people are going through very difficult situations, simplicity sticks the landing better than sophistication. Something that just lifts your spirits because it's light as air and you just can't resist how wonderful it is. The melody went like this. If we took a holiday, took some time to celebrate, by the time Curtis offered Holiday to Madonna, two other artists had already turned the song down, but her recording would deliver the stardom she'd always craved. Holiday was like a wrecking ball that smashed the wall that Madonna had been facing. It was her pop breakthrough, and it was the start of her becoming one of the biggest stars on the planet. It's 1983, and Madonna has risen from dance school dropout to dance chart star. This is the story behind the three songs that launched her into global superstardom. With the first, Holiday, just about to be released. It was her first mainstream pop song and would go on to be a hit across the globe. But while the song had worldwide appeal, it was rooted in New York's disco-influenced R&B scene. I was in a band called Pure Energy. It consisted of myself, Raymond Hudson, my brother, and uh, Lisa Stevens, the lead singer. Lisa had these chords. I wrote everything else in, in the song. The melody, the lyrics, um, the arrangement, everything else was was my ideas. As soon as uh, we got to the point that we heard the the intro part of Holiday Day, da -da 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 -da. when Curtis created that part, we knew the song had a certain energy. I would say it was a positive energy, and we was like, we got to do something with this song. Holiday had all the elements a catchy pop anthem needed. But if Pure Energy thought it would make them famous, they were wrong. When we finished the recording of the demo, I let tons of people hear it. And when every time Holiday would come on, everyone would say, that's a hit. Stop that, play that again. That, that song is a hit. And we was hoping that it would be the song that launched us, but uh, our record label, they turned it down. And that's when we decided that we were going to shop the song to other artists. Two of those artists turned the song down. But remaining convinced of its potential, Curtis and his bandmates turned to their New York disco contacts. We had a relationship with Jellybean, John Benitez. Jellybean was a very influential DJ, and he wasn't just at one club, he was in about sort of six clubs, including Studio 54. It was three, 4,000 people in his club, and if he spin your song and your song catch on, nine times out of 10, your song was probably going to be a hit. But it was Jellybean's romantic rather than clubland connections that landed the perfect artist. Madonna and he hooked up, and I think it was very fortuitous that they happened to come together at that time. They was dating for a while. I mean, I don't know how serious, but we know that they was um, very close, very close. That's how we ended up meeting Madonna, because what we did was went to this club called The Fun House, where Jellybean was a big DJ. And uh, he invited Madonna there. After we met with her and she told us she loved the song and, you know, pretty much asked us could she do the song. And as a whole, we decided that maybe this something with, between this song and this artist might be something magical. With the agreement struck, Madonna turned up at the studio ready to record Pure Energy's song. But right from the start, she made it clear it was now her song. 
Madonna comes in the door singing holiday. Holiday celebration. She was like really happy about it. So we know the holiday gonna be good for Madonna. She was watching everything that happened in the studio. She wanted to make sure that nothing didn't mess the song up or hurt the song. I remember when I was doing the guitar parts and I was playing it a certain way and she stopped. She said, uh, do you have to do that? You can hear the bounce on the strings. So when you put the two of those together, it's a very funky track. That's what they call the funk, you know, it's, it's, it's the guitar pick hitting up against the strings and giving a funky, you know, rhythmic feel. She's like, but can you do that without, play it without doing it? I said, yes, but I don't want to do that. And so we kind of like had a little uh, debate about that. And I think Jelly Bean shut it down, you know, so like he's a guitarist, let him play it. How many artists even pay attention to that? <laughs> you know, so I was annoyed a little bit, but I was kind of impressed at the same time. The thing about many artists, you see their personalities change with, you know, the attention, the money, the publicity. Madonna was always the same. So when she hadn't sold a record, she was as difficult as when she'd sold 50 million records because she knew her own mind and she was generally always right. Madonna may have been difficult over the instrumentals, but when it came to laying down her vocals, she was downright demanding. Other than the producer, she ordered everyone out, including original vocalist Lisa Stevens. Jellybean informed us that, well, Madonna don't want anybody to be in the studio. So we was like, okay, <laughs> you know. I mean, I kind of felt bad, because Raymond and myself, we was there, you know, in the session for the, the rhythm track, and we was participating in that. And Lisa was like, I guess she was saying, okay, vocals next, and, and Madonna had a different idea. Even at this young age, she would take no bull from anybody. She would believe what she believed and she trusted her own instinct. And time after time, she proved to be right. She brought a sort of innocence that's gonna to appeal to a lot of young people. Ah, she brought her liveness, she brought her identity, she brought energy, she brought her style. We wasn't in the studio at all. That's why we were surprised when we did hear her final vocals, we were like, wow, okay, they sound good. Madonna at this stage was a great vocalist because she had something that you'd not get on a lot of club records. Her diction was really clear and she sounded like she was riding the rhythm and just kind of almost speak singing the words. Yeah, if we took a holiday, no riffs, empty the space. If we took a holiday, Just one time to celebrate. Empty the space. Some time to celebrate. Just one day out of life. It would be, it would be so nice. Madonna was all about rhythm and attitude and vibe. And Holiday had all of those imprints. Holiday was the first showcase for a vocal style that would soon become instantly recognizable all over the world and was an important step towards the global phenomenon that Madonna would soon become. It quickly became a mainstream American radio favorite and reached number 16 on the all-important US Billboard chart. Madonna was a mere disco artist, no more. Holiday took her to the next level. I mean, that, that was really getting radio play and people were aware of Madonna. She was a force to contend with. Holiday was her pop breakthrough. It was irritatingly unforgettable. It kind of worked its way into you. All those involved in the recording of Holiday believed it would be a hit, but surprisingly, the record company Warner Brothers hadn't even bothered to produce a promotional video. There are a couple of performances Madonna gave for a little lip sync promotion spot, and those sort of ended up being what was used as the video in people's minds. 
The video is absolutely charming because she's so free in it. The dancing is kind of goofy. It's a little bit like uh, doing the sailor's hornpipe. It's great. She's got this kind of skipping little dance that she does, but it's the same dance as she did every time she performed this. The kind of swaying from side to side. She knows exactly where the cameras are. She looks fantastic. Those looks caught the public's attention as much as the music. The first of many Madonna styles was born. Madonna's image when she first burst upon to the scene in 1983, it was very New York thrift bohemian with the fishnets and the distressed uh, denim and leather. We have the scarf and the tousled hair. We've got the really acutely defined lips, loose top, the layers, the skirts, the little dancer leggings. She looks like a cute, broke New York dancer on her day off. It kind of took America by storm. You know, it was just, a, the mall was just a sea of teenage girls uh, trying to dress up like her. It was an iconic look that was endlessly copied, not just amongst her fans, but amongst other pop stars too. The street style may have looked thrown together, but every aspect was carefully thought through. As photographer Richard Corman found out during one of her first professional shoots, I had never met anybody like Madonna. From her dark roots in her hair, to her red lips, to the makeup on her eyes, to the, the way she was dressed, the torn jeans, the jewelry. She was living art. I knew I was in the throes of something remarkable. Her sexuality was a part of every photograph we took, whether it was uh, through her humor, whether it was the way uh, she looked into the camera. She made an ordinary stove sexy and funny and playful and charismatic and three-dimensional, unlike anybody could have. Working with Madonna, it was jaw-dropping for me because I had never seen somebody that was so comfortable in her own skin. And if she wasn't, you know, I was totally <laughs> fooled. With mounting record sales and magazine front covers, it was time for the next step in Madonna's transformation into a key cultural figure. It came with an appearance on America's premier TV music show. American Bandstand is a pop music institution on US television. The fact that Madonna was on such an iconic show was really important. To those who'd worked with her, Madonna's ruthless ambition was an open secret. Now, she was about to share it with everyone. What are your dreams? What's left? Mm, to rule the world. <laughs> and you just think, what hubris. But my God, she was right. There's plenty of talented people out there, more talented, much more talented than Madonna, but they do not have that drive. It had taken barely a year for Madonna to move from an obscure dance artist to mainstream star, and she would always have this song to thank. Holiday was like a wrecking ball that smashed the wall that Madonna had been facing. It was her pop breakthrough, and it was the start of her becoming one of the biggest stars on the planet. Holiday was a great entry-level song for future Madonna fans. It was just the fun Madonna, the escapist Madonna. But there was a series of other Madonnas already in the pipeline, and as the styles kept changing, the hits kept coming. By 1984, Madonna was an established pop act, following up her breakthrough hit Holiday with the equally catchy Lucky Star. You must be my lucky star. Her sound and image had inspired other female artists. And soon, rivals like Cyndi Lauper were vying to take her place. Madonna knew she had to hit back. Her next release, Borderline, hit the top 10. But behind the scenes, she was working on something much bigger. With Madonna, all of the hit singles were at building blocks. We were building a success route, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger to make her into the huge star she became. 
The key to that stardom arrives later that year, with a track that was to smash away convention, confront controversy, and put Madonna in an unassailable position in global pop. Hi, we're in New York, and here's a song from my new album entitled Like a Virgin. Like a Virgin broke Madonna on a worldwide stage. You know, Holiday had bring her breakthrough, but this was her golden ticket. Like a Virgin was Madonna's first number one hit. It's really one of the more fascinating songs in pop history. Hearing Like a Virgin for the first time was a shock because the word virgin wasn't really used on the radio. Like a virgin, like, like a what? Excuse me, lady, like a virgin? You know, those days are gone for you. Like a Virgin came from the pens of Billy Steinberg and Tom Kelly, the celebrated duo behind a string of top 10 hits for other artists across the 80s. Billy Steinberg and Tom Kelly co-wrote so many great 80s pop songs. I'm thinking about I Drove All Night, uh, True Colors was another one. Such deft songwriting. True Colors and Shine. Steinberg and Kelly had never worked with Madonna before, and they didn't compose the track with her in mind. The song tells the story about how I extricated myself from a very difficult relationship and found myself in a new joyous relationship, which made me feel shiny and new. like a virgin. I was really surprised to find out that it was written by a man reflecting on a time in his life when he'd come out of a bad relationship and was sort of finding his mojo again. I did feel when I came up with the title that I had something special and something a bit irreverent and something that would tickle people's imaginations and sense of the word virgin. I kind of got that, that it would be provocative. With the risque chorus completed, Billy and songwriting partner Tom Kelly began working on the rest of the track. We didn't find the right direction for the music immediately. And then he started to play a bass line that resembled I Can't Help Myself by the Four Tops. He was playing that bass line. I propped the lyrics on his piano and he started singing falsetto. I made it through the wilderness. Somehow I made it through. I said, that's it. And then the song quickly wrote itself. It may only have been a demo version, but Tom Kelly's falsetto became the blueprint for Madonna's final vocal. An interesting part of it is the fade at the end of the demo, because you can really hear how she copied all Tom's ad libs as our demo was fading out. Madonna just basically lifted the whole performance. Like she just copied it from beginning to end, including all of the little sighs and oohs and ahs, and even just some things that are said on the outro of the record. I mean, that's how perfectly conceived it was from songwriting to demo. Brilliantly conceived, but tough to sell. When Steinberg and Kelly completed their track, almost no one would touch it. We started to play the song for various A&R people at different record companies. And we did get the response that no one would ever sing a song titled Like a Virgin. But fortunately, it was perfect for one singer, and her name was Madonna. 
Madonna has so many talents, and one of them is to know when a song is right for her. And somebody from the record company presented Like a Virgin to her in the demo form, and she went crazy. Everything about it was right for Madonna. It feels like there is no other singer in the world that could have sung that song. With Like a Virgin chosen by an excited Madonna as her next track, Sheik's legendary guitarist, Nile Rodgers, was brought in to produce. But initially, he had his doubts about the track. Nile Rodgers, he wasn't sure. He was like, it's kind of a weird hook to sing Like a Virgin, and I'm not really, you know. She was like, no, this is, trust me, this is absolutely it, and she was right. Once Rodgers overcame his doubts, he and Madonna shared the studio for every moment of the production, including some awkward ones. She came up to him and said, do you think I'm sexy? And he responded, well, of course, you know, you're one of the most attractive people I've ever seen. And then she said, well, why haven't you tried to sleep with me? And then stormed out of the studio. It was just her way of kind of like goofing around, but also kind of like keeping him on edge. Whatever the studio tensions, the results were worth it. For Madonna, it was the song that changed everything. Like a Virgin, for her, was the moment where everybody who had thought she was a passing fad realized that actually, this woman, she's a game changer. She went from being a potentially big star to being a huge, huge star. Helping the song provide maximum punch, the video. The sexually charged performance was the template for many more videos to come, and this time along the canals of Venice. She's writhing around in a gondola, going through a tunnel and coming out the other side. I mean, that's just so ham-fisted and so on the nose. I think what this tells us about Madonna is that she just loves to shock. She lives to shock. That was the first time she was thought of as outrageous. And that really lit a fuse. So for that, um, it was a really important record. In music, at this point, what you really didn't have is a female artist who didn't look as though, or sound as though, they were interested in romance. You look at this video, the performance, and Madonna, who was sexy on her previous stuff, suddenly becomes Madonna, who is sexual and there's a big difference. Sexy is like me and I'm pretty and I look great, don't I? And sexual is I'm in control. Like a Virgin was the first moment in the rise of the Madonna phenomenon that we see her using the shock value of unashamed sexuality and the power of controversy to create record sales, something she would continue to do across her career. I like to provoke people, but I don't think about the danger of it. And if there is a dangerous element, that's exciting to me. The single ruled supreme at the top of the Billboard chart for a phenomenal six weeks. It was certified gold in the US and went on to be a massive worldwide hit. I think Madonna became a pop cultural icon the moment Like a Virgin was released. As soon as that song hit the airwaves, there was no turning back. Like a Virgin took Madonna to the next level. The songwriters Steinberg and Kelly had helped her find the superstardom she'd always dreamed of. But when they saw her at a party sometime later, there was little appreciation. We see at the other end of the terrace, Madonna walking out of the house towards us. And she was with Warren Beatty. And I thought to myself, well, this is a perfect opportunity to meet Madonna finally. And a guy we knew said to Madonna, Madonna, I would like you to meet Tom Kelly and Billy Steinberg, who wrote Like a Virgin. And Warren Beatty started to laugh. And I think he was laughing because he thought, you know, of course she must know the guys that wrote Like a Virgin. It must be some kind of a spoof. I stepped up and I said to Madonna, I've wanted to meet you for so long. And she said to me, well, now you did. And she grabbed Warren Beatty and walked off. So she wasn't particularly uh, cordial, shall we say. 
As was the case from the beginning of her career, Madonna's eyes were fixed only on the future and her next incarnation, recalling Hollywood's ultimate blonde bombshell and featuring a song and iconic video that would come to symbolize not just Madonna's pulling power, but a whole global decade, Material Girl. The mid-1980s saw free market economics sweep across the West. You too can become leaders in this great new era of progress, the age of the entrepreneur. Britain is confident, strong and trusted. In the booming financial centres of New York and London, fortunes were made fast and spent even faster. For the lucky ones, the consumption had never been more conspicuous. This was the Ronald Reagan era, the greed is good. Dynasty is huge on TV. Everyone's into more, more, more. In America, 1985 was all about big hair, big shoulder pads, uh, big wallet, all that kind of thing. The new era demanded its own soundtrack, and Madonna was the one to provide it with a song that would finally cement her superstar status. There was ever a song that summed up an artist that captured an attitude of the time, that was a moment. Material Girl saw Madonna reunite with production genius Nile Rogers. Right on the one there, give me a nice fall off. And to help him create another irresistibly catchy hit, he brought in one of his most trusted backing artists. Well, in uh, 1983, my brother George and I were asked to sing on uh, David Bowie's Let's Dance album, produced by Nile Rodgers. And uh, we did that, and then we toured with David Bowie around the world, and as soon as we got back, uh, Nile Rodgers called us again and told us uh, he needed us to sing background vocals on a new record he's producing by a young girl named Madonna. Well, Niles is a local guy, and he had New York attitude, New York tastes, and Madonna, too, was very connected to Niles' modus operandi. Niall has a great atmosphere around him, and Madonna was very involved as well. You saw when you just sat in the studio that she had an opinion. She wasn't the produced act. She was certainly learning the craft, as she does everything. She looks at other people. She soaks it all in. Niall is so giving, she was absorbing. Despite her newfound stardom, Madonna's vocals were still developing. And for this track, Rogers knew she needed help. She wasn't that uh, skilled a singer, so we background vocalists, you know, kind of helped her out and gave her some pointers and kind of moved her around and told her what to do. So she was learning from everybody, I think. Well, if you want to use a, a scale of like, I'm going to go from one to 10, maybe she's at like a two or three. She wasn't bad, but certainly had a long way to go. I wouldn't say that she actually fully discovered her voice until later. Over this period of time, what Madonna did is she found her sound, she reinforced it, she imprinted it, and when people criticized it, she gave them more of it. I am a material girl, living in a material world. I am a material girl. It was the song's distinct lyrical pattern that made it such a challenge for the singer. Material Girl has a lot of beeps, blips, and bloops, and it kind of chugs along in an electronic fashion. There's these, uh, like, robot men. Living in a material world. Living in a material world. It's playful, it's boppy, but it's also relentless at the same time. A little bit like Madonna herself. Despite needing help with her vocals, Madonna, true to form, made sure everyone in the studio knew their place. Every time there was a break and we'd be going right back to re-recording or whatever, you know, Madonna would say, OK, boys, time is money and the money is mine. You know, so that got to be like a slogan. So when she wasn't around, we'd say, uh, yeah, Madonna, remember, time is money and the money is hers. <laughs> But by the end of the session, she and everyone else knew they had another hit on their hands. 
We finished Material Girl and we went back in the listening room. It just sounded great, you know, everybody loved it. We were laughing, laughing, laughing. Madonna was laughing her stones off, you know, and it was just like, oh God, this is ridiculous. <laughs> People are gonna love this. With the recording complete, it now had to be promoted. For the video featuring big name actor Keith Carradine, Madonna chose to pay tribute to fellow blonde bombshell of yesteryear, Marilyn Monroe. She would be taking on one of her most iconic 1950s performances, and with it, her characteristics and costume from the American musical comedy, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. I didn't know her personally, but I admire her. She's an idol. You want to be as big a movie star as she was? Is that important? Like, yeah. Mary Lambert, the director of Material Girl, really did a fine job of recreating Gentlemen prefer blondes. You know, the diamonds are a girl's best friend scene. Anytime you're dressing up like another performer, especially someone as iconic as Marilyn Monroe, it's kind of embarrassing at times because the original swallows up the imitator. But I think Madonna had such supreme confidence that she's able to take Marilyn Monroe and use her for her own purposes in a way that respects Marilyn Monroe but that leaves Madonna herself intact. Some boys kiss me, some boys hug me, for many, Material Girl was a wholesale celebration of 80s consumerism. But as the video hinted, it was actually a subtle criticism. In the Material Girl video, Madonna wants to be the sugar daddy. She is the breadwinner. The video includes someone who's trying to attract her attention romantically. Yeah, he's still after me. He just gave me a necklace. I don't know, I think it's real diamonds. When he tries to show off how wealthy and important he is, she has no interest in him. It's only when he humbles himself, when he you know, picks her up in this beat up pickup truck, that she even gives him the time of day. So there's an irony about it in the video and the song that was kind of lost on a lot of people. Her message may have been misunderstood, but at the time, it didn't matter. Material Girl's success put Madonna exactly where she wanted to be. She started the year 1985 as a rising star. She ended 1985 as the biggest female artist in the world. And this, this video, this song, was the moment when we knew this was happening. It cemented her as a force to be reckoned with. You understood that this, she was a juggernaut. Madonna was now officially a megastar, and that year would go on to release several more singles from her Like a Virgin album, all of which entered the US Billboard chart top five. Musical success was followed by movie success as she co-starred in the critically acclaimed 1985 comedy drama Desperately Seeking Susan. And to cap the then most eventful year of her life, she married Hollywood actor Sean Penn on her 27th birthday. Madonna created a whole new way to be a celebrity and especially to be a young female famous person. This is someone who, you know, at every step of her career uh, was told not to do things, but always stuck to her gut and her guns. Madonna actually tore up the old book of rules that said a female artist had to be demure, had to at least appear to not be in charge. She says, no, I'm gonna do exactly what I want when I want. And there's something really inspiring and empowering about that. Madonna had started her career as a broke dance school dropout on the streets of New York. And with just three songs in three years, she had become a cultural icon who defined a generation. Early 80s Madonna kind of sums up, for me, some of the best things about the 80s. She presumed that success would be hers, you know, and that's a very 80s idea that even if you start out with certain limitations and inadequacies, you can overcome them. So she embodies that. That was her revolution. That's what she brought. And I think she's really the first modern pop superstar for that reason. In 1982, Madonna was an unknown but up and coming. By 1985, there wasn't any way you could go in the world where people hadn't heard of Madonna. In three years, she transformed not just her career, but she transformed pop. 
From humble beginnings as Smile to stadium sellouts Queen, follow their rise to superstardom in the band that rocked the world brand new tomorrow at nine. Next, over to ABBA and the secrets of their greatest hits.